Um, such a pleasure to meet you and have you here with us today, um, Dr. Perver Rawal. And to our audience, I wanna give an introduction and then we'll proceed with our questions. Um, thanks so much. Um, I first wanna give a congratulations to Dr. Rawal for being with us today as Senior Advisor and Chief Strategy Officer with the CMS Innovation Center at CMS. And just as by way of background, which is very extensive, um, Dr. Rawal joins us from having served previously as the principal at Capital View Strategies and also adjunct professor at Georgetown University. Dr. Rawal also has extensive experience having worked in the Senate, serving on the Senate Budget Committee during the Affordable Care Act during its passage and also working with Senate, um, Senator Lieberman. Um, she also brings experience working at Avalier and starting her career at the National Academy of Sciences. So again, thank you so much, Dr. Rawal, for being with us today and bringing this extensive experience and we look forward to this discussion. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, so just as I refer to your um, interesting and extensive background, um, also you bring a PhD in clinical psychology, um, and I didn't even refer to the fact that you wrote a book on the Affordable Care Act. Looking at all that work that you did and now coming into government service and coming into um, CMMI, can you just share um, your choice in coming to government service and coming to CMMI at this point in time? Yeah, Mary Beth, that's really kind of you to say. And you know, I'll just start by saying that it's a real privilege to be back um, to government service and especially at a time um, of such opportunity. So I wanna say thanks to you and the team at BMA, including Robin and Jonathan, um, as well as everyone in attendance today for the chance to speak with you all. Um, I think one of the reasons that it's, um, you know, such an exciting time to be at the CMS Innovation Center in particular is the vision that um, CMS leadership, um, including the Innovation Center Director, Liz Fowler, have articulated to solve some of the big delivery system issues. Um, it's a bold vision, and it's really a privilege to contribute to those efforts. Um, you know, the goal uh, that they've laid out at a very high level is for us to keep the ball on um, broad system transformation. So since March of this year, you know, I want to talk just a, a couple minutes, um, you know, you said, why is this a good time to kind of be at the CMS Innovation Center? And so if you don't mind, I'll just um, talk for a few minutes about our strategic mm -hmm. refresh. I think that might add a nice, um, you know, foundation um, for everyone in attendance today. Um, since March of this year, um, you know, I've only been at the Innovation Center for two months now. So this, the, the, the work that's gone um, on around a strategic refresh uh, predates me. Um, you know, since March of this year, uh, my colleagues at the Innovation Center have really been engaged in re-examining um, the Innovation Center strategy and, and kind of charting the course for the next decade. Uh, this included a review of what's been accomplished uh, since 2010 when uh, the Innovation Center was established. Um, over 50 models have been launched, lots of seeds have been planted, lots of lessons have been learned. Um, and so, you know, they've, they've looked critically at, at the portfolio. Um, we've also looked to both internal experts and external experts and leaders, thought leaders to inform um, the path forward. And as you may have seen, the framework for this new strategy was laid out in a blog post that was published in Health Affairs in August. Um, it was authored by uh, CMS leadership, including the CMS administrator, um, Chiquita brooks Lasher, um, Liz Fowler, and the heads of the Center for Medicare and um, the Center for Medicaid and CHIP Services. And the purpose behind the strategy um, effort and the blog is, again, like I said, to chart a path forward uh, for the next deck for the CMA, for the Innovation Center's second decade that provides guidance and more clarity on where we're headed in value-based payment and care. And you know, I'd be remiss not to add that um, one of the other reasons for the strategy refresh and really honing uh, where we're headed is to increase and sort of accelerate the momentum and the movement to value-based care and reignite that sense of inevitability um, you know, that I think many of us felt um, 10 years ago uh, when the ECA was first passed. And the strategy refresh really has five objectives. 
and I'll run through them at a very high level. The first is to drive accountable care. This is really foundational uh, piece of um, the, the new strategy. It's to increase, and the goal is to increase the number of people um, especially Medicare beneficiaries in relationships with providers that are accountable for their patients' costs and for improving their care. The second is to advance health equity. I think this is one of the most important things we can focus on in the next 10 years, and it's a significant priority across CMS and HHS. So the Innovation Center is going to be playing its role um, in, um, in advancing health equity. And we really view addressing health disparities and promoting equity as a really important element of improving healthcare quality. We, you know, one of the charges of the Innovation Center is to, um, you know, to reduce um, costs and improve quality. Well, we can't improve quality if we're not addressing equity and, and closing those disparities in care and outcomes. And so moving forward, we're really committed to um, embedding equity into all aspects of our models and increasing our focus on underserved populations. And I think we also see this as an opportunity to coordinate more with community-based organizations and those um, you know, that are on the ground doing this work. And I know that we have many of those organizations that provide services to address the social determinants of health and attendance today. Mm -hmm. You know, the third pillar is really um, supporting innovation. So we wanna design models that give providers the tool to deliver care that's person-centered. So we talk a lot about person-centered care, but what does this mean? So, you know, this means uh, us being able to provide, um, you know, making sure that uh, providers have the tools and that they're able to use those tools that um, enable integrated whole person care. Um, so examples include having actionable practice specific data um, to them to support care delivery. Um, you know, disseminating best practices, peer-to-peer -peer learning collaboratives, and, and payment flexibilities, which many of our models have included, um, but I think we want to increase the uptake and um, expand those flexibilities where it makes sense. Um, so at the end of the day, the tools and the, the, and the, you know, the care innovations really should be enabling the delivery of that integrated whole person care in the settings, you know, that beneficiaries prefer. So for instance, the home and community. Uh, the fourth pillar is to drive affordability. So this objective really focuses on ways that models can address healthcare prices, affordability, and reduce unnecessary or duplicative care. Um, oftentimes, this has both direct and indirect costs on beneficiaries. So we think about, um, you know, for instance, when I'm talking about indirect costs, you know, we want to keep in mind, um, you know, the needs of Medicaid beneficiaries. So while you know many of them may face very limited to, to no cost sharing, there are a lot of indirect costs related. Um, with fragmentation and in-care delivery or um, having difficulty you know, accessing providers. So I think we want to um, think about those issues as well. And then the last is partnering to achieve health system transformation. And I think um, this is one that I think is really important um, you know, in speaking to you all today is that the, the, the vision that I just started to lay out here is ambitious and it requires collaborating with a wide range of stakeholders and in many cases stakeholders that the Innovation Center has not um, traditionally um, regularly and systematically been in touch with. Um, and so, um, you know, achieving this vision requires working across CMS um, and beyond um, for um, kind of a shared um, vision and approach. And then beyond the health affairs blog that I mentioned in August, we're also working on a white paper um, that you know, uh, hopefully provides more detail on the lessons that we've learned over the last decade, the goals that we're setting for each of the objectives I just described, mm -hmm. um, approaches and different considerations for how we're gonna measure our progress, um, and then areas that the Innovation Center is exploring you know, to advance these goals of accountable care, health equity, and, and partnership in particular. Um, so, you know, when I lay all this out, it's just, you know, it's an exciting time to join the team um, at the CMS Innovation Center and to, um, you know, be um, engaging um, with stakeholders um, such as you all. Well, so appreciate you sharing um, the further work that you've been doing um, related to the pillars that were laid out in the blog post from August. Um, and appreciate um, you recognizing um, several of those areas that have, are priority of our allies, um, you know, specifically um, health equities. Um, the you know, Medicare Advantage program prioritizes um, the service um, that we're able to provide in the Medicare Advantage program to the low income and minority populations. And we all realize that um, in our healthcare system, we need to do better, and that's um, a real priority. And so we very much appreciate the prioritization um, and the focus that the administrator and um, you all are doing to focus on health disparities. And I greatly appreciated the opportunity, um, Dr. Raul, that 
um, the administrator had given, um, I want to say, I think it was early September, um, the administrator had brought together um, stakeholders um, and included myself in that group. And it was just refreshing to see um, with diverse stakeholders, the prioritization, the focus was on health disparities and just to know the leadership um, that um, CMS was gonna play in bringing us um, together. Um, so fully support and also appreciate you recognizing um, the community-based organizations who are our allies who um, are here today, who um, are in the state and local communities um, serving those um, populations. So appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to pivot a bit um, when you were referring to the models um, that you focus on, um, you know, as at BMA, as we, you know, prioritize the value of Medicare Advantage, um, just to be able to get your insights um, on some of those demos. And then there's obviously so many different uh, models um, that we're focusing on. Um, some is, you know, the hospice demo, the VBID demo, um, <coughs> um, the primary care first demo, the direct, direct, contract, dot, yeah, direct contracting demo, just to name a few, Dr. Raul. And just to be able to get your insight um, you know, onto those um, demos, just when you were talking um, about some of the work that you're doing at CMMI. Yeah, no, I'm happy to. I can talk a little bit about MA and talk a little bit about direct contracting. Um, you know, obviously you all are very well uh, versed in the statistics for Medicare Advantage, but, you know, as um, MA continues to grow, we know there's a lot of opportunity with the, you know, with our, our VBID model and other efforts um, and plan participation to really shape the healthcare landscape. Um, you know, we know that, um, you know, enrollment in, in Medicare Advantage has, you know, almost doubled from 2010 to 2020 and you know, over the first decade of the center. Um, and it's, you know, projected to, to grow to make up more than half of all um, Medicare beneficiaries by 2030. So having a better understanding of the experience of those beneficiaries enrolled in MA is really crucial um, to determining how the future of care is delivered. Um, so, you know, and we also know that, you know, Mary Beth, you mentioned equity and, um, you know, in my kind of preparing and talking to your team about um, the issues that are important um, to the folks in attendance today, um, you know, obviously health equity came up right away. And so that goal of improving health equity um, has to be uh, woven into, in, into investigating this. And, um, you know, we're recognizing that um, enrollment increases in MA have been concentrated among dual eligible beneficiaries, um, you know, Black beneficiaries, Hispanic beneficiaries, and individuals in underserved geographic areas. So these are all kind of data points um, from the marketplace that we are looking at to inform our own efforts. Um, you know, to date, CMI has been focused on texting, testing um, flexibilities and how um, MA benefits are provided through the value-based insurance design or the VBID model, um, which tests a, a broader array of um, MA health plan innovations or different kind of programmatic flexibilities. Um, again, with the goal of reducing program expenditures while improving quality for beneficiaries, including those with low incomes. And, you know, um, if you look at the growth in the model, it's been pretty tremendous. Overall, um, the VBID model has grown from 45 plans in 2017 to over 1,000 in 2022. Um, this number translates to, an, you know, it's an increase in the number and types of clinical and social needs focused interventions. Um, they're reaching beneficiaries, um, and, you know, that are, are reaching more and more beneficiaries. I think um, in 2022, uh, we're projecting that 3.7 million underserved enrollees or Medicare Advantage um, beneficiaries are projected to receive model benefits. So it's a pretty, um, you know, a significant number. Um, so some of the key flexibilities um, within the model and that, you know, we want to continue to evolve and iterate on, um, you know, increased participation, um, you know, the ability to, uh, to so one of the key flexibilities, I'm sorry, uh, within the model um, mm -hmm. where we've seen increased participation uh, is the ability to target reductions in cost sharing um, or, you know, offering um, primarily or non-primarily health-related supplemental benefits to members that have particular health con uh, conditions or who receive low-income subsidies. Um, this, you know, includes meal delivery programs, transporta transportation for non-medical needs, access to virtual community programs, counseling, or companion care to address social isolation, mm -hmm. um, 
assistance with rental support for enrollees who, who, who you know, who receive low income um, subsidies. And I think these are many of the efforts that the folks in attendance here are engaged in. You know, these are the organizations providing those services. And so those are the kinds of, um, you know, flexibilities, um, you know, within the model that, that we want to continue to, to examine and test and understand what that what that means for beneficiaries in the program. Um, uh, you know, it's largely this ability to target and offer additional benefits for underserved communities that, you know, we think positions health plans, that can position health plans that participate in the VBID model to lead on health equity. Um, and so, uh, again, this is going to continue to be kind of a, an important area of focus in our um, MA um, portfolio. Um, you know, in building on this, you know, pretty spectacular, you know, pretty significant growth and participation uh, moving forward, we want to use a learning system approach to kind of accelerate engagement of Medicare Advantage organizations in the VBID model um, in a targeted set of high impact areas. We want to think about diffusing evidence and best practices related to, you know, how um, some of these specific interventions are delivered. Again, you know, many of the folks in attendance today are the ones doing that service delivery. You know, what's working, what's not, and how do we um, do a better job of diffusing that um, and understanding those um, supplemental benefits. Um, and, you know, in addition to, um, uh, in order to test other benefit and quality and payment inequities, um, CMMI plans to do some additional analyses and partner with the Center for Medicare, other interested stakeholders to explore model testing, um, you know, in, in new areas, um, you know, with an emphasis on understanding the impact of incentives in the MA program, and of course, improving outcomes for underserved populations and safeguarding the, the trust fund. So, you know, this is an area that is going to continue to be um, a focus. We've seen a lot of um, positive plan growth um, and, you know, increased reach of, um, of these services to beneficiaries that are, are served within the models. Thank you um, very much um, for that feedback. Um, and also, again, um, it's just really helpful to hear how you're able to recognize um, so much of what were um, the you know, increase in participation and the flexibilities and the various elements of the Medicare Advantage program um, that um, really brings you know, the interest of seniors um, and their choice in the program. And when you recognize those who are here you know, with us today, um, some of those um, elements that you're referring to is also what we're you know, talking about over these couple of days at the summit, um, just to be able to you know, learn more about those benefits. You were just referring to you know, isolation. Um, that's something that um, we're discussing um, at the summit, just to you know, understand more of that and especially um, and I know this is a lot of what you're discussing at CMS, just you know, what we learned coming out of COVID. Um, there were problems before, but you know, these issues that were elevated even more you know, through COVID. Um, so thank you for that feedback. Um, I think we have um, time for one more question. I wanna respect um, your, your time because um, it's so limited and also just to know that um, we respect your time. So it's something when you come back, we know that we're valuing it. Um, but when you do talk about demonstrations, just, you know, what are you um, areas of demonstrations that excite you um, at CMMI? Yeah, I mean, I think for me uh, right now, and I think this is core to our strategy, um, you know, when we think about our goals around accountable care and health equity, um, two areas that are, you know, a significant focus um, for us to be able to kind of achieve some of the goals that we've laid out um, are a focus on accountable care. Um, and advanced primary care strategies. Um, mm -hmm. Those are areas that are just critical to broad system transformation. Um, you know, we've seen over the last decade that ACOs have, you know, they've demonstrated promise in reducing expended Medicare expenditures, um, you know, with comparable or improved levels of quality for beneficiaries. So I think we need to, you know, we need to we recognize that we need to increase the number of ACOs and beneficiaries assigned to them, you know, increase opportunities for more providers to be able to participate um, and to, to be able to deliver that kind of whole person um, integrated care that I talked about earlier. Um, you know, in terms of uh, what we have right now, I think you, Mary Beth, had referenced our contracting earlier. You know, that's uh, really our third generation ACO model, really building on um, the work that was done with first generation models like Pioneer ACO and, and second generation models like the next, um, next gen ACO. Um, you know, I'll say that, um, 
the, the second piece of that is, as I mentioned, um, advanced primary care. It's really critical to improving quality outcomes and managing the total cost of care, um, as you all know. Um, it's, uh, you know, advanced primary care is inherently more patient-centered as practices are set up to provide that continuous access to a care team, care management, and integrating um, other care services like behavioral health and specialty care, screening for, for SDOH and, and referrals. Um, and, you know, we really think about the right incentives and tools in place, advanced primary care um, can incentivize and should incentivize practitioners to address um, their beneficiaries' chronic conditions earlier on, hopefully upstream and comprehensively, um, so that we're mitigating, um, you know, the need for more uh, acute service use down the line. Um, you know, our new model, Primary Care First, builds on, um, you know, uh, some of our earlier efforts, um, like the comprehensive primary care plus models. We have lots of lessons that we've learned, but, you know, in terms of the, um, both the older um, ACO and primary care models and uh, really informing kind of uh, where, we, where we go next. And we think that um, both accountable care and primary care have to play a really pivotal role um, in um, our uh, vision of, a, of broad system transformation, really important elements in the strategy moving forward that I think are really exciting. Thank you. Well, thank you so much um, for your time and also just um, really the discussion you've given us and the specificity is really informative and all that um, you're doing at CMMI and Liz and you're just terrific to be able to come Perva and, and Dr. Raul to this um, you know, audience here and appreciate um, being able to have the opportunity to work with you and look forward to uh, the white paper that you had referenced um, to following up on the pillars that you all had shared um, at the end of the summer. Well, I just want to say thanks for having me. I know that, um, you know, your time is limited as well and appreciate the, the chance to talk to everybody. And I hope, um, you know, we can kind of be engaged in ongoing dialogue as we get further, um, you know, in our work as well. Absolutely. We would very much welcome the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much.